Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, a VP of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Jarell Oshodi, who's the Deputy Chief Privacy Officer at the CDC. I am glad that you are here. So on this podcast, um, we generally talk about cybersecurity, information security, which is a, a pretty broad topic. And that, that, that topic can include privacy. But I, I think there is really a, a distinction between uh, privacy and security when you sort of get down to the, the details, that they're, they're pretty distinct. And uh, the, the two disciplines, security and privacy, don't always align with each other. So I'm, I'm excited to have you here to talk a little bit about the, the privacy side of the, the larger cybersecurity industry. Um, and I wanted to start with maybe just that, that topic of understanding what the difference is. So Jarrell, from, from your perspective, how do you see privacy and security as, as different? How are they distinct? Well, with security, um, or I should say with the security professionals that I work with, they're generally um, concerned with the, the what they call CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. So, you know, they don't want, they want to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of bad actors. They want to make sure it doesn't get tampered with. Um, they want to make sure that it's available when we need it. And those are the things that they um, tend to focus on. However, um, as a privacy professional, I or uh, we tend to focus on um, the rights, the rights that individuals have to control their personal identifying information and, and how it's used. Um, so, um, basically, as a security professional, they may feel like uh, you know we've guarded against these malicious threats, um, and that like. Um, but and on the privacy side, we're more so focusing on the life cycle of data, how the personal information is collected, shared, used, um, destroyed, retention policies, uh, things like that when it comes to not just information, but um, information that ha includes personal um, identifiers. And so if I, I mean, if I think about that as sort of, you know, two over, you know, a Venn diagram with two overlapping circles. Um, you know, security, as you say, is focused on bad actors. I mean, privacy obviously cares about bad actors as well. If they're, you know, violating the 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 privacy rights that are, you know, of concern, and and security, I would think, cares about some of the privacy aspects um, because obviously, if you if you fail to protect the data, it can then fall into the hands of, of bad actors. Definitely, but keeping personal data away from hackers doesn't automatically make an organization compliant with data privacy regulations. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, I always, um, I always, that always makes me think back to the, the payment card industry, the PCI data security standard, um, which is a a security standard. But um, when you dig into it, you 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 have to remember that it's there actually to protect the the card brands not the organization. So understanding the motivation behind the controls and protections in place, even if they're the same, is, is really important. It, it changes what the, the objective is. Like. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And in, in privacy, we definitely, um, especially with regards to privacy impact assessments or what some people may call um, data protection impact assessments, we are definitely looking at the controls. We're looking at technical, administrative, um, physical controls. We're questioning them, making sure... Um, we are collaborating with security professionals to find out like, hey, what do you think about these technical controls? Because, you know, I'm not as well versed as um, my counterparts. So um, it's definitely a collaboration um, more than anything. Well, so so let's talk about that that role a little bit um, of, of a privacy officer, you know, uh, because it's different from being a security analyst, as we've talked about. What is your your job as a privacy officer? It encompasses uh, a myriad of things, all identifying um, PII. So when it comes to uh, mapping data or 
I actually shouldn't say mapping data because I know in the security world that <laughs> means something else. So just keeping up to date with our data inventory, um, implementing privacy by design. So we, we want to be, we want people to reach out to us and contact us to ask us questions and guidance um, when new products um, are being thought about or new systems are being thought about. Uh, we want to be reached out to in the beginning because we want privacy to be embedded into the entire process. We don't, uh, when, when we're contacted after the fact, <laughs> Um, we, we realize holes, we realize gaps, we realize things where uh, data privacy wasn't taken into consideration. And, you know, it costs more money to go back and fix something than to um, basically be included throughout the process. Um, also, notifications are a huge um, deal. So no, making sure employees, third parties, uh, customers are notified, are uh, given cons the opportunity to consent, um, with the opportunity to withdraw consent. Um, also, just uh, developing privacy operations all together from trainings, um, annual trainings, uh, tabletop exercises. Uh, contracting is a big part of it as well. Uh, especially when personal identifying information is involved. We want to make sure, even with a, a data use agreement, we're sharing information for research or what have you, we still want to make sure that the party we're sharing the information has the proper controls in place. And they're going to take as good care of this data um, just as we would. And, and they aren't going to share it with other people. Um, we want to just make sure that Risk assessments are done. So as I spoke about PIAs, we want to make sure that when a new system is being developed, we're doing a PIA, but also when that same system decide, or um, authorities decide, hey, we're going to use the same system, but we're going to collect a different type of PII or more PII, or we're going to use the same PII but for a different purpose. Um, you know what I mean? It may you may have a system where no social security numbers were involved and now we're going to be adding we're going to be collecting ssns now so that requires different controls or um you were going to be using the pi for a different purpose that requires different consents that, that requires what they call fresh consent things like that and also collaborating with the security function when it comes to data incident response so um our security um department, they incur different types of data incidents and breaches, um, but we may not be needed if it doesn't involve personal identifying information. But if it does, we're immediately notified and, and we have to um, mitigate those risks and determine how notice should be given um, to those affected, uh, things like that. And, and more, more so related in the government sector, we have the system of records notices. Um, and those are published in the Federal Register. So if we do have a system of record, a system of record is basically just a system where um, information is retrieved by using uh, some personal identifier, like a Social Security number or something like that. So if, um, if it's considered a system of record, then we have to provide notice to the public, and allow 30, a 30-day 30 comment period in the Federal um, before it's um, allowed, and then we have these routine uses for these systems um, that allows us to utilize people's PII to do our job, to do the job that the system was created to do, um, to process information or what have you. Uh, so I mean, it's a it's a myriad. Of, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I could go on, but um, yes, definitely. So we're working with. All the business units, privacy is involved. Uh, it, we're not siloed at all. Anywhere there's PII, basically. Exactly. So marketing, uh, finance, HR, research and development, uh, you name it, PII is likely involved. But the, And honestly, we would love to minimize the use of data. That's like our main goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shrink the environment as much as possible. Yeah. So that's so. Is it highly valuable for you to have sort of cross-functional knowledge of how those different functions operate in order for you to do your job more effectively? It seems like it would be. It's important to have 
cross-functional knowledge, but it's more so important to have cross-functional relationships Um, because I don't know everything. I'm not interested in knowing everything, but I'm interested in having relationships with all of these different business units, um, making sure they know that um, my door is open, the lines of communications are always open, and based on um, privacy by design, please reach out to us. Please, let's talk about this. Um, you know what I mean? You're not bothering me. Uh, if anything, you're making my life much easier. And also creating privacy champions with these people in these different, um, in these different areas. Um, as I impart knowledge on them, they can, uh, because, you know, in many organizations, the privacy unit is, Generally, a small uh, group, you know, tasked with doing more with less. And so the more privacy champions you have, the more trainings you can do, um, the less risk for human error, uh, incidents, uh, things like that. And and they get, they notice, they see how um, as we work together more, we can create FAQs, we can create uh, flow charts, things like that, where they don't necessarily have to reach out to us as much because they are um, empowered by the knowledge um, that they have because of our relationship. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. When we talk about cybersecurity, like security analysts, there's often a, you know, sort of a, a technical background there. It's pretty common for people to move from, uh, you know, sort of an IT role and then they become interested in security and they move into a security role from there. That's a, you know, today there's a, you know, educational career path that people can take. But in the past, it was often IT. Your background, however, is in, in, in law as opposed to technology. Is that right? Yes, I am not... I am not technical at all. Um, I rely heavily on, um, so we have our technical privacy analysts and we have um, more so our compliance privacy analysts. Um, So it's a team effort. Um, I definitely, you know, I am an attorney. I know the law. I know how to apply the law, operationalize the law. Um, But also I know how to be resourceful (laughs) and uh, uh, leverage those that do have the technical backgrounds to translate uh, what I would li- like to implement. They can, though there are translators between the technical um, and the compliance. So for someone who's interested in, in privacy as a career, is that law background a requirement? Is it just um, particularly helpful? Or is it that there, as you sort of were describing, there are two disciplines, there's a technical side and a, a legal side? Oh, no, yeah, it's definitely not required. I mean, there's privacy counsel. Um, so those are generally attorneys, people with legal background. They call JD adjacent um, or legal adjacent type positions. Um, also privacy c- compliance where JD helps. Um, but there's also a, a new growing field. There, There's actually a, a new um, certificate for it, um, but the privacy engineers, privacy engineers is gr- that field is growing. They are basically uh, they are the tech people who are the translators. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, they're the best of, of both worlds, if you ask me. Um, but then there's and then we have the security and the people who are more technical, or someone that may have their um, CISSP or something like that, um, may not be able to uh, communicate as easily with someone like me who has my, who, you know, I may speak legalese. 
And the privacy engineer is the perfect uh, middle person uh, to help uh, get the job done. Yeah, to, to split that difference or provide that, as you said, that translation of the, the legal language into the technical implementation. So you, you obviously work at a, a you know large government agency, but privacy isn't something that's exclusive to, to government. So what are sort of the key differences between privacy considerations for a government agency versus a, you know, a, a commercial organization? Well, um, so for instance, in the government, uh, the Privacy Act of 1974 is um, our, the main law that we follow and operationalize. And under it, you know, that's that required. That's why the under the Privacy Act or under the Privacy Act, there's the eGov um, Act and that states, you know, for every system, a privacy impact assessment is required. Um, those system of records notices I spoke of are required. Um, people can um, request information that an agency has on them uh, in a system of record through a privacy act request, and we're to respond in a certain number of days. Um, on the other side, on the, in the private sector, there's all of these sectoral privacy laws, state privacy laws, um, other countries, they have their own privacy laws and they they have the same principles, but for instance, uh, data subject access requests uh, and under in the private sector, states like California or uh, like GDPR, they have a long list of individual uh, rights that they have with organizations so they can request access, uh, deletion, correction. Uh, they have a long list of requests that they can make and there's, they also have a certain amount of days that uh, those things must be completed. Um, there's all, But there's no system of records notices required or things like that. There's no uh, need, there's no mandate that a privacy impact assessment must be completed for every system that a, a company has. Generally, I know with GDPR, uh, DPIA is only required uh, when sensitive PII or high risk PII is involved, uh, things like that. But those are uh, differences, uh, the obvious differences um, that I see. And, and also with contracts, uh, the contracts in the private sector, I know that um, there's less red tape. Um, many of the, because there's no federal privacy law, um, and every state doesn't have a privacy law, lots of the data protections that are in place are contracted. There are data protection clauses involved that, um, that are mandating uh, how data is protected, shared, used, destroyed, things like that. So the Privacy Act of 1974 obviously predates much of the technology that we're using today, but it still provides the foundation for the privacy requirements and practices that are, you know, that we apply today in, in you know, our sort of much more connected world. Um, was the, the second piece that you mentioned in there sort of a, an update that allows, updates the law to apply to the, the current technology? How does that work, actually? That's fascinating. Well, actually, the Privacy Act um, is based on the, I believe it's the Fair Information Practice Principles. Mm -hmm. um, and the Fair Information Practice Principles are actually uh, what <clears throat> I personally feel all of these privacy laws are based upon. Um, the are you familiar with the with that? No. Well, no. I'm going to say yes, but you know, for the benefit of the the listeners, uh, you should explain it. So yes, the whole um, the collection limitation, data quality, um, purpose specification, where you need to you know state the purpose or the reason that you need PII, the use limitation, saying you can't disclose it or you. Can't collect it for one reason and use exactly. it for another. Exactly. The security yeah. safeguard principle, the openness principle, uh, the individual participation principle, that's just all of the rights 
that uh, individuals have with regard to their information and the accountability principles. And that's saying that the person who is controlling my data has to be accountable by, you know, complying with whatever reg or measures are in place. Um, so though the um, FIBS is really what uh, all privacy laws are based on, but yes, the privacy law of 1974, um, I find it interesting that um, 10 years ago when I was handling privacy access requests for individuals and FOIA requests for individuals, <clears throat> now I see all of, I always, I always, uh, I felt like I was speaking another language when uh, people, my friends were in the private sector and didn't, uh, they would, they just were like, they didn't, they weren't aware of how much uh, or how many rights we had with regard to our personal information. And now many of them with these, the data subject access requests in the private sector, they get yeah. it. <laughs> so, yeah. And it seems, you know, from an, an external perspective, it seems like GDPR was really sort of a, a, a watershed moment for changing the public perception of, you know, sort of uh, data, data rights. 100%. People didn't even know that, uh, that was a thing, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it also caused, it also caused companies and corporations to um, manage their data better because if it was mapped properly, you're able to, you know, it, it's created in a way, um, back to privacy by design, uh, it's created in a way to where if you need all the information on Jarrell Oshodi, it's the data is mapped in a way that you can see what systems, uh, and you know, and you're able to carry out that action or carry out that process. Yeah. yeah. If you're required to, to, to be able to delete all the data on, a, on an individual, you better be able to find all the data on that individual. Exactly. And that's how it starts. That's why, uh, data inventory is the, is the very beginning. You can't manage what you don't know you have. Yeah, yeah. Which is we also can't as far as data incidents and data breaches. Yeah. It's an interesting corollary to the, the, the security phrase you can't you can't secure uh you know what you don't know you have as well. And same for, same is true for data and privacy, yeah. Definitely. And, and yeah, they definitely uh overlap, most definitely. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So I, I, I want to I want to end our conversation with maybe a, a sort of a little practical advice for uh, the security folks who are listening, the security analysts and professionals. Um, so coming from 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 the privacy side of of the industry. What what lessons do you think information security can learn from privacy? It would be nice if they understood um, that we that our job isn't done just because we've mitigated a breach or uh, just because we prevented uh, access uh, in a particular. Place like we're always focusing on best practices, minimizing data where we can, um, just constant risk assessments um, when data is used in a certain way. Um, that's that's really interesting. You 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 touch there on this this idea of sort of minimizing where data is used as a a means to, you know, essentially shrink the footprint of what you have to be concerned about and. That seems like something that that security could could look at, um, you know, sort of the the concept of minimizing the surface area, if you will, um, for attack or for for an attacker as a as a you know a means to to reducing the amount of work um, to secure an environment. Yes, yes. So if we the less PII involved, <laughs> the lower the risk, the less uh, high risk. Uh, the less risk as far as like if if a, a system is hacked and all the information is uh, and none of the information involves PII, then the risk is a bit tends to be a bit lower. Um, 
because companies, it's their reputation at risk, it's the trust of their clients, um, things like that, that it's a competitive differentiator, if you will, these days. Uh, so the the more de-identified information we can use or anonymous uh, anonymized information we can use, the better. I want to thank you, Jarrell, for joining us. I thought it was a, a super interesting conversation. I, I learned a lot about privacy and what it means to be a privacy officer. Um, and um, I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Oh, thank you. I appreciate uh, you asking me and I appreciate discussing it as well, because I feel like no one knows what I do. So, <laughs> Well, now now some people do, at least. And thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, I hope it was enjoyable. And I hope you'll tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.